Hi, uh, my name is Siddharth Jain, and I actually don't work for Cloudera. Um, I work for Salesforce. Um, and um, this application we've been building for some time um, to do uh, log processing, normalizing data uh, at large scale. That's something we're going to talk about today. Um, so, so we, we've, um, uh, I work for the trust team in Salesforce, and we collect lots of unstructured logs. Um, and we, we've tried uh, different um, off-the-shelf products and some open source products um, to do basic, uh, you know, take basically uh, unstructured data, structure it, and then make it uh, useful for um, analysts, uh, for, you know, search and um, other use cases. Um, and we found that, um, you know, uh, each time, like, with commercial products and open source, we ran into several uh, issues uh, um, more and more at scale. And so with, uh, with this stack uh, that we put together with Spark and Kafka, uh, we've, we've tried to resolve all, most of these issues, and uh, we're at a point where the, the application looks fairly stable. Um, so uh, we want to process and normalize log streams. Um, so streaming is the key over here for us. Uh, it's basically a massive regex matching engine. Uh, we, uh, we are currently, we peak at about 100K events per second. And we want to scale, uh, we want uh, an architecture or a design uh, that can scale to a million events per second. Uh, we want to be able to just add more data streams um, into the pipeline without necessarily having to uh, retool in terms of software or configurations um, uh, or, or um, hardware we may have to add, but that, that's probably the only factor that we, we want to be, uh, be able to add. Um, and uh, as with most stacks, we want horizontal scalability um, and fault tolerance. So uh, basically, um, we don't want a massive monolithic uh, system in the back end that says you cannot have more than 12 cores or 20 cores or 100 cores. We want to be just be able to infinitely scale horizontally. Um, and, and then within the stack, uh, we want a, a, a plug and play between uh, different tiers. Um, and also be able to bring down uh, the tiers uh, that do processing uh, to you know, for allow for maintenance or crashes or anything of the sort, and still allow the pipeline to either pick up from where it left off or continue to function. Uh, some broad level goals um, for, for in terms of use cases. So a basic use case is to be able to search through all the data that we collect, um, and that can be something like Elasticsearch or Solar or any technology that um, allows us to just you know, casually search the data. Uh, allow for computations, uh, so data science use cases or even very simple use cases of um, aggregating data um, and then um, looking at the data and doing, doing some kind of alerts. Um, and a special use case, which is um, enriching the data. Um, so as uh, streams of data come in, we want to be able to integrate or look up um, key values um, uh, from thread feeds that come into uh, coming from other uh, sources, internal and external, and then um, join all of that data together. Um, and, and so um, this is this gets really interesting because um, you're doing really massive uh, joins either at compute time or, or at execute time. Uh, in terms of um, user expectations or tolerance. Uh, due to some uh, internal compliance uh, reasons. Um, the maximum is five minutes. Um, although in, in the stack we have up now, the, the lag is about um, less than 30 seconds for, for the most part, even when we peak at 100K events per second. Um, and like I said before, we, we want to be able to scale uh, to a, a million uh, events per second. Uh, another uh, important thing for us is across the entire data set, uh, across use cases, we want to maintain a consistent data dictionary. So frontline analysts, um, when they look at the data, uh, uh, they, they can then use uh, that schema and talk to the data scientists in the back end. And if the data scientists develop any models, um, they know exactly what the frontline analysts can expect. Um, so, so uh, allow that co collaboration between uh, very tactical frontline analysts and also 
in the back end data scientists who are doing uh, much deeper dives. Okay, so I'm Harish Sridharan. I've been at Cloudera for about three and a half years. Uh, I'm still at Cloudera, so. Um, when uh, Salesforce actually told us they're looking at developing this app and they came up with a couple of these solutions, we actually tried to investigate and figure out if, you know, what's wrong with this? We tried to play devil's advocate and figure out what's wrong with it, with each of these solutions. Um, and I'm also an Apache Flume PMC member, so I obviously had a bias towards using Flume. Uh, and uh, we then started investigating Storm and Spark Streaming. We did not support, so, uh, support Storm by itself, so you know, most of that work was done by Salesforce folks, so I won't claim any credit for that. Um, but we actually investigated doing uh, much of this in different, uh, different ways. The first one was to use Flume. So Flume's actually a pretty uh, pluggable, uh, pluggable system. You can actually take each piece of Flume and replace it with your own. So, because most of the pieces which were required were already available in Flume, we actually just picked up like the syslog source with a file channel. File channel is a durable uh, write ahead log, but it's local. It doesn't actually, it's not a distributed write ahead log. To a custom interceptor to uh, a sync to HDFS. Now, a custom interceptor is basically a piece of code that receives all the data and processes it. It's uh, because most of the processing was individual pieces of data, we could have actually gone this way. The only problem with this was that if a node which is running this Flume app failed and you, know, you lost the disk which is, actually writing, uh, which is actually holding that data, there's a problem. The file channel is actually writing to a single disk. Unless you spend time and money raiding this or putting it on some storage that's already replicated for you, you're gonna lose that data. And since data loss was not an acceptable pro uh, solution at any, you know, you, no, I cannot lose data even if I lose a disk. In that case, this was not really a viable solution, but it was a solution which could have been used if you know, we actually ignored that one edge case where the data could be lost or delayed. Um, with Storm, that issue wasn't there because you're not actually storing a whole lot of data anywhere, but the problem with Storm was that the Storm API is really, really low level. It, writing a Storm Bolt and a Storm Spout and all that is pretty low level, and there's no real API available to do any transformations for you. So we ended up having, like, you know, at the, again, not we, they ended up having uh, to write a whole lot of code themselves to do this. Even the save to HDFS uh, uh, API available in Storm was, you know, pretty barren. They had to actually take the Flume code and port it over to Storm to actually make it work. Um, I don't think they actually did the whole thing and said, hey, this is not actually gonna work. The third one was to use Spark Streaming. So I started working with Siddhartha and his team uh, when they were actually deploying the Spark Streaming implementation. Uh, in the implementation, they had something that pushes data into Kafka. So Kafka was the first point where Spark Streaming would actually pull the data out from. Uh, Spark wouldn't directly talk to Syslog because you know, talking to Syslog is a pain in itself. So uh, Spark Streaming would pull the data out from Kafka and then the uh, Spark app, which we will talk about now, actually computes, uh, computes certain aspects um, of the application, of the data, tags it, and then writes it back to Kafka. So uh, writing back to Kafka was one of the pieces of interest, and uh, they actually wrote their own piece of code that does this write back to Kafka, but uh, it is something that we also, uh, from a Cloudera point of view, have heard from multiple customers. They have wanted to write data back to Kafka, so we actually implemented uh, this and just put it on GitHub for, on the Cloudera GitHub, so if people wanna use it, there's a library out there which can be used. We have not yet tried it um, in Salesforce's specific scenario, but we have actually tested it out, so writing back to Kafka from a Spark uh, DStream or RDD works fairly well, uh, provided you have enough uh, capacity on your Kafka cluster too. And from Kafka, there was uh, you know, other ways to push it to the storage systems which we are going to talk about, Elasticsearch, uh, HDFS, et cetera. That's, uh, you know, so I just wanted to talk quickly about the solution stacks. I'll hand it over to Siddhartha to continue. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, it, between those three, um, I did the entire end-to-end -end for f the Flume pipeline, and then we figured uh, both scalability um, was an issue, scalability and then redundancy was an issue. Uh, Storm, um, I got as far um, uh, as uh, reading the entire um, 
uh, getting started page, and that was way too long because I'm not a developer. And uh, by the time I was reading, done reading it, was, and then I looked at the Spark one, Spark one just basically said, download the tarball, and then run some daemon, and then invoke the Spark shell. Um, and so the repel uh, feature in Spark uh, or Scala helped a lot in just you know, trying out code um, and seeing what works because these were early days. I was, I was starting to play with Spark streaming back in point nine. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the things that factored into the decision. So this is uh, just um, an overview of the entire stack um, or, or the core of the, uh, of the stack that we've built uh, so far and, and productionized. Um, so at the bottom, uh, what we do is we force everything, all the data that we collect into um, syslog, and, and it pro provides a very reliable uh, transport of data, um, and is um, you know it's something that a lot of devices, especially operating systems and network devices, just natively speak. Um, and if a, if an application or device doesn't speak, we we put some connectors to uh, transform the data into into basically a syslog message. Um, and then. Um, we aggregate again all this all this unstructured data without doing any, doing any processing with it um, into uh, into a, a tier of um, our syslog daemons that then directly push the data into Kafka, and so all this data goes into um, a topic that we just call say unstructured um, uh, data, uh, and then Spark streaming the Spark streaming app picks up um, uh, the data from the unstructured topic, um, does a massive regex matching and spits out JSON. The JSON that spits out goes to a different topic in Kafka, um, and that's where all the consumer tiers hang off. So in, in this case, the consumer tiers are basically the Elk stack and the entire um, Hadoop stack. Uh, this ensures that you, uh, the, there's consistency in the data dictionary and also basically the, just the data. Uh, and um, users and data scientists don't have to you know, take raw data, do their own normalization for each use case, and then scroll away data in their own little tiny, you know, location on HDFS or MySQL or someplace. So it's a very consistent way of looking at the data and also consuming the data. Um, also takes off the load of log stash and plume for doing any computation. Those are just purely transport engines. Um, and, and then in here, I can plug and play with a lot of technologies I can hang off say, a uh, graph processing engine just off Kafka, uh, the Kafka bus. I can replace Kafka itself, and if some new technology comes along, I can just plonk it um, in their middle. Um, Spark gets old, I take fancy to Storm, I can replace a Spark app, and I can do all these things in parallel while maintaining the existing production pipeline. So it's just a matter of switching um, or forking pipelines. Uh, this is what the data, uh, this is what typical data flow looks like or the life of a single event as, as it goes through the pipeline. Uh, so at the top, uh, an unstructured message comes in uh, via syslog. Uh, we feed it into the, uh, a Kafka topic uh, that again just stores the raw message as is. Uh, the Spark application has a configuration file which has a whole bunch of regexes and some tagging information uh, that is specific to each regex. Uh, so we do this massive regex matching, and then we spit out um, uh, the JSON to not one but multiple topics. What we do is um, each message, um, once it's processed, goes into a normalized um, or structured uh, uh, topic. In addition to that, um, each uh, regex uh, that, that is matched has its own topic, so all the messages that match a specific regex will go to that topic. and then. Across the data dictionary, each key has its own topic. So all the values for that key will get posted uh, to, to those topics. So I think of it more as a streaming table, um, and then because that allows uh, applications that plug into uh, to Kafka to not have to consume from the fire hose. They can just consume uh, a sip from whatever you know, specific um, keys or specific messages that they're looking for. Okay, um, so um, I, I've been uh, running this stack for, for some time now. Um, so some lessons we learned um, uh, uh, over a few months now. Uh, so we right now hit about a peak of 100K events per second. 
uh, aggregates to 3 billion events a day. Um, end to end delay uh, from the uh, from the, uh, point we receive a message in syslog uh, to the time it shows up in something like Elasticsearch, we typically send, see a delay of like 20 seconds, uh, which is fairly good. And it's a factor of how much hardware you throw at the problem. Um, the bottlenecks we've, we've seen is, uh, um, as I think uh, TD was talking about this earlier, is make sure that the entire, all the tiers um, have parallelism into it. So right now we have only two R syslog instances that are writing into Kafka. And that um, tends to be a bottleneck, and that's basically because I'm waiting for some more hardware. Uh, the Spark uh, configuration, we have 100 executors, um, uh, 200 gigs of RAM across the 100 executors. Um, and then uh, the CPU, we use 400, but those are uh, massively um, oversubscribed, basically. Um, also, something interesting we ran into until 1.1 was um, the inherent uh, partitioning of data across executors uh, didn't quite work as advertised. And because, uh, so we had to use concurrent jobs in Spark Streaming to keep, uh, keep up with the data flow or, um, or the volume of data that was coming in. Uh, otherwise, we would see massive scheduling delays that would just keep climbing up until it crashed the application. That, I'm, uh, I'm glad to say it's being fixed as of 1.3. Uh, we still have to restart the application every few days uh, but it's a lot better than earlier when we had to restart it in like a uh, few hours. So uh, in the Spark Streaming app, there were certain choices we needed to make uh, which actually affected the quality of the job in production. So when we had this running for a long time, we started seeing multiple issues. Uh, sometimes it was, you know, data is not getting processed. Like, it just looked like it got stuck. I don't know what happened. Sometimes, you know, stuff was getting processed, but it was really, really slow. So we had a batch interval of, you know, five seconds, but each batch would take several seconds more than that to get processed, eventually leading to a massive uh, scheduling delay. And over, you know, several hours, you would have, like, a massive number of batches which are pending and data never getting processed in time. So... Uh, all of the 20 second, 30 second delays started increasing and it would go to one minute, two minutes, and eventually several minutes. So we had to actually start looking at various ways to uh, you know, fix this issue. So the first thing was concurrent jobs versus actually union and partition. So uh, before I go into the details, this was actually using the Kafka receiver-based API, not the one which Cody actually uh, talked about yesterday, um, which was the receiver-less but parallel uh, uh, parallelly pulling data from all of the Kafka topics, uh, ca uh, Kafka partitions on different executors. So this one was based on the receiver, so the data was still being pulled in by a single receiver. So we had multiple receivers to actually pull the data in. At that point, we actually tried concurrent jobs versus unioning the RDDs, uh, the restreams, and then uh, partitioning it. So we actually ended up having to repartition the data to actually uh, make sure all of the um, all of the executors were being used in processing it uh, once we received it, because the partitioning in a receiver-based, um, in the receiver-based Spark Streaming API is basically based on when your data comes in rather than how many partitions the data is being pulled in from. So it's not a true indicator of parallelism. So we had to apply some repartitioning logic uh, to ensure that we uh, wouldn't end up actually underutilizing the cluster. Um, so that was one of the things which uh, we had to do. The second one was reading and writing from Kafka, from to Kafka, right? That's a very tricky thing to do because every time you write data back to Kafka, uh, there is, you know, inherent API in Kafka which hides a lot of detail from you, but you don't realize until you actually use it that, you know, if you use a producer and keep using the same producer instance, that's sticky to a single partition. So you end up sending all of your data to a single partition rather than, you know, parallelly to different partitions um, on the, in the same topic. So things like that uh, actually affected the time delays in uh, processing our data because the data would come in, we'd process it, and write it back to Kafka within the batch. So the longer it took to write to Kafka, the higher the scheduling delay was. And when the scheduling delay starts increasing, it started becoming more and more painful because we had no idea why it was increasing. So a large part of our problems were how we did our I.O., how we did writes to the external system rather than 
you know, internally inside Spark. It was not just the application, not the way the application was written, but APIs in the external system, and with 50 to 60 percent probability, I can say most people would use Spark streaming with uh, Kafka. So, you know, this is some, uh, these are some lessons we learned when we actually started using Kafka, that if you're using producers and keeping them around for long, they'll end up writing to the same topics all over again. And if you're uh, using Kafka, produ uh, Kafka consumers uh, to pull data from uh, Kafka, you probably want to do it on multiple machines, so you want to either use the receiver-less API so that it's already parallel for you, or if you're using the receiver-based API, make sure that you have many receivers running and they're pulling data off in parallel. The other aspect of things was we also needed to make sure we scale the Kafka cluster with the amount of data and the amount of uh, processing we did. So as the Spark cluster size increased, Kafka started becoming a bottleneck when Kafka wouldn't receive the data fast enough. Part of it was because we didn't have enough partitions. Part of it was just that you know, producers would get sticky. The other aspect is you just needed more nodes. You needed more Kafka nodes to support the, all the partitions we were adding. So we had to actually make sure that the Kafka cluster also scales together with the amount of data and the amount of parallel processing we are doing on the Spark side. Now, what were the issues faced? Gladly, none of them were actually inherent to Spark streaming. It was either an aspect of bad configuration or you know, us not using the uh, APIs or the available uh, data smart enough. Like if we, if we used a single receiver, we knew there were problems. We knew that only after we did it, so we had to actually add more receivers. So none of these things were actually Spark's own fault, but these are things that people who actually productionize Spark streaming are more and more likely to run into. And these are things you would learn from experience rather than like it's not written in the book unless uh, it is there in the learning Spark book, which I have not read. Uh, but I would eventually read it at some point, Patrick. <laughs> so going from pre-1.0 releases to 1.3 was a big change. Uh, not just stability, not just uh, ease of use, it was also the aspect of increasing number of configuration variables. Like Spark 0.9, there was configuration variables, but not a whole lot. From one, uh, you know, 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, then there was a wall added, and then there was the parallel Kafka API added. The number of config knobs just increased so much that we had to fine tune each one of those to figure out how it works. So, and when we actually played around with the configuration, even minor changes in configuration actually you know, affect the way the application performs. So sometimes it was actually difficult for us to identify if it was just the configuration change that you know, fixed the issue, or if we were doing something wrong somewhere else. So sometimes configuration can be hard, especially uh, when you have so many options available, both on the Kafka side and on the Spark side, and then again on the Spark streaming side. Uh, Jan came to, uh, we were running this thing on Jan, if uh, I think we did not mention it, but we were running this on Jan. Jan actually caused some headaches for us. The first one being log aggregation. Jan, uh, uh, Jan does log aggregation, which means at the end of the, uh, you know, when the app is done, it'll copy all the uh, logs to HDFS. The only problem is that it'll copy the logs only when the app is actually done, not when the app is running. For an app like this, where it's really long running, it starts filling up disks. It starts causing issues on executor nodes because every time we logged something that is actually causing the node to become more and more, uh, you know, more and more overloaded with a whole lot of data being written out to a local disk rather than to HDFS. So this was one of the issues we faced. Uh, there is still no real solution for this. Yarn log aggregation cannot still copy data periodically. Uh, I think they're working on it, but this is one of the things we are investigating, whether we should actually turn on yarn log aggregation to make sure that data gets copied periodically and uh, doesn't crash the cluster. Yarn client versus yarn cluster mode. Again, I have no idea why we have a problem here. It's supposed to work. Both are supposed to be identical, but this app works in yarn client mode, but not in cluster mode. The moment we start in cluster mode, we get a bunch of yarn errors and it dies. So, we have not actually spent time investigating it, to be fair. We are like, okay, it works in cluster mo uh, client mode, let's just run it, like, we'll look at cluster mode later. Eventually, when we get the time, and if we want to actually look at it, we'll probably look at it and figure it out, and it's probably, a, again, a small configuration issue somewhere. But that is one of the issues we face, and we really don't have a solution to it. 
Other solutions, these are actually very subjective. These are not really, uh, you know, these are not issues for everyone. It's issues in some cases. The first thing, it's a distributed app. Really difficult to actually debug an IDE. Anyone here tried to actually debug a Spark app in an IDE? You probably would find it really difficult to do it. Because when running on a cluster versus local mode, there are so many things that you wouldn't actually be able to figure out why it's happening. So difficulty to debug is not just a Spark issue, it's just a general distributed systems issue. The second aspect of things were like, how do we debug and how do we debug bottlenecks, failures? Like, it's almost always really difficult to find out why things failed or what are the bottlenecks in the, uh, you know, in the whole flow. With so many moving components, Yarn, Kafka, Spark, Spark Streaming, it was actually very difficult to find out when things were getting slow and why. Sometimes it was just, you know, scheduling delays were just because it was taking a lot of, lot of time to process because executors were oversubscribed. Sometimes it was also because of the aspect where Kafka writes were really slow. Figuring out which one it was, it was quite difficult debugging it. And the problem is that, again, you can't debug it in an IDE, so we had to do a lot of logging to figure it out, at which point yarn log aggregation came in the way. So, you know, one problem followed by another problem made it more and more difficult to identify and figure out what the issues were. Then we learned a very important lesson. I'm fairly sure many people in this room agree with the last point. If something gets fixed in a future version of Spark, like you upgrade from 1.3 to 1.4 and suddenly a problem goes away, don't bother trying to figure out why it was not working in 1.3. Like a thousand commits go in between 1.3 and 1.4. You're probably not going to be able to figure out why that went in. I work on Spark. I work, I, commit, uh, I contribute code to Spark. I can't figure out how half of the things got fixed. So I just give up. Like, oh, it's working in 1.4. Fine, it works in 1.4. Just upgrade to 1.4, right? So that's all. Just you find that it's fixed, just be happy with it. <laughs> now, all of this is open source. Uh, I mean, all of this is based on open source. So if you have problems, you can always go and look at the code. The best part of it is that being pluggable, you can actually add more pieces of uh, you know, open source. You want to add Cassandra? Yeah, go ahead. So that's the whole aspect of things which we liked about Spark and which we liked about Spark Streaming which, uh, we, for which we chose this. Everything was pluggable. Uh, most of this was integration and plumbing. We didn't actually end up writing like 50,000 lines of code to get this working. It was just getting the plumbing right, talking to Kafka right, talking to uh, deploying it right, making sure it's configured right. And it's all running on hardware which you can just order and not like fancy hardware built specifically for this use case. It's just hardware you can order deployed in a data center somewhere. So this, uh, the whole aspect of uh, getting stuff done was much easier considering that most of this was just taking stuff and fixing it in such a way that they work together. Okay, uh, that's pretty much what we have. If you have any questions apart from, uh, you know, confidential stuff which Salesforce won't share with you, uh, anything else? So please. a quick comment, um, it's not open source yet. Uh, and I ca cannot give you a very concrete timeline, but we are looking to open source all the work, including uh, several um, other enhancements and other consumer apps uh, that go on top of the stack. Okay, I think we don't have any questions. Yeah, we are done. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>